Hey everybody, it's Michelle and this is Queer Hustle. And today I am very excited to be chatting with Jen T. Grace from Publisher Purpose Press. You wanna introduce yourself to the crew, Jen? Yeah, thank you, Michelle. I'm, I'm happy, to, happy to be here. So I'm the CEO and founder of Publisher Purpose Press and we are a nonfiction book company. So we, a book publisher. So, you know, we do audiobooks, eBooks, paperback, print, the whole, the whole nine. Um, and we work with diverse owned businesses for the most part. So about more than half of our authors are queer, about 70% are women and another 30% are people of color. So it's a very active and intentional effort from, um, you know, just my core values, but on our team's part to make sure that we're serving communities that are often underrepresented. So that's kind of the, the big nutshell of what it is that I do. And I love this and I'm excited to talk to you because, you know, this is the type of business that a lot of people don't even realize that this exists. And when they sit down to write a book, they think that they're on their own and they're sitting there with their cursor blinking and that they just have to <laughs> write a book and they have to find someone to publish it. You're helping people navigate through that process. Tell us a little bit more about exactly how that works and um, what kind of, what stage are people at when they come to you? Have they already written a book or they, do they not know where to start somewhere in between? Yeah, that's such a good question. So the ideal person is someone who already has their manuscript written. However, that is oftentimes not the case. So we have different kind of programs and, you know, like we have a program called Getting Started for Authors. And it's like all of the fundamentals of like how to actually get started. And there's like a little bit of like tips around the writing process, but it's more so like how to just create a routine and a structure and a plan. So that way you're not just aimlessly writing into a Word document, hoping for the best, but you have like a very clear roadmap of how it's going to get done. And then a lot of times those folks end up working with us, you know, after the fact, once they have their manuscript done. But, you know, it's, it really is a daunting process. And I always say that I think people imagine writing as like some solo, I have to take a sabbatical, I have to go isolate myself for three months to kind of do this thing. But the reality is that we work with business owners, people who are speakers, people who are thought leaders. And at the end of the day, me taking a three month sabbatical is a non option. And it, that's the case for most people. So we really kind of modify our processes to make sure that we're able to kind of adapt and pivot with the clients as we're working with them, because who knows what happens, like, you know, even with COVID, right? Like everything just kind of like blew up overnight. And it was like, all right, how are we going to be there to be a support for our authors as they're going through this process? Because it's not a siloed, isolated journey. It really is a team sport, even though it might not feel or seem like one on the surface. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's been interesting. You talked about a lot of your business owners being speakers and things like that. I'm, I'm in the middle of writing a couple of books myself and getting those done. But for that, you know, reason as a business owner to start to like publish some of my content out. When your people are working toward, I guess, thought leadership generally, this year has been tough for that. All the stages went away. Mm -hmm. There's only so much thought leadership you can do from Zoom. Trust me, I've been trying to do as much as I can, but there's only so much thought <laughs> leadership you can do without getting up in front of people, getting on stage. How are you helping your clients navigate that? And at what, you know, where does a book fall into that when things have been a little less traditional yeah. this year? You know, that's really interesting because we have authors that truly span such a wide gap. So we have folks who are aspiring speakers and we have some that keynote at 35,000. So like it is a very, very, very wide gap between them. However, what we've noticed just kind of in, in the aggregate is while yes, there's not in-person events, there still are a few here and there. And so some of our authors have had access to those opportunities. They're obviously limited and socially distanced and things like that. But what I've seen happen, because I also am a speaker and that's how you and I ended up meeting was at a conference we were both speaking at. And what I've noticed is that the speakers themselves have like, to a large degree, kind of like rallied around and made it really clear that they're not going to speak for free just because it's a virtual event. Mm -hmm. And I find that really inspiring. So there's a lot of, you know, especially on Facebook, there's a lot of groups that are very specific for um, like the BIPOC groups or queer speaker groups. Like there's things out there where it's a very inclusive kind of dynamic. So what's interesting is you can kind of see people sharing like what their speaker fees are amongst each other. And it's in, you know, it's still in a private Facebook group, but it's still in a public forum. And so what I've noticed is that a lot of our speakers have been able to kind of make that pivot. And I, I don't, I'm tired of even saying that word, but here we are, you know, you know, pivoting from COVID. But, you know, what's interesting is that I'm seeing a lot of our authors now after a couple of months or after six months, eight months, starting to like really see like, okay, like all of my income hasn't dried up from speaking. I just have to make a significant change in how I'm doing this, which might mean that they're not keynoting, but now they have to be on a panel 
or maybe it means that they have to do a breakout session instead of keynoting. So I think some of it is uh, dealing with our egos and not being like, hey, I was this amazing keynoter that would get at least 15 grand every time I did something and being a little bit more nimble and saying like, you know what, I will take 5,000 to be part of this particular conference. So I don't know, I've seen a lot of um, adaptation. And so we have a speakers bureau that's exclusively for our PYP authors because of this exact kind of thing where organically over the years, we've been like negotiating contracts on their behalf because I don't know if this is your experience, but it's always easier to have someone else negotiate on your own, on your behalf. So I could be like, well, Michelle doesn't get out of bed for less than 25,000. Or, but if you were to say like, I don't get out of bed for less than 24,000, you look like an ass. So it's like, it's this weird um, dynamic. So we kind of organically were doing that for folks. And so, you know, in at least this year, we've been more reactive about it because I do get a lot of inquiries from just an assortment of people saying, hey, I'm looking for someone who speaks on this topic. And I see you have a couple of books that are along these lines, like, could you recommend somebody? And then I go to the authors that I think are applicable. I ask them what their budget is. And then I kind of, you know, liaise between. And so, you know, it's kind of a fun thing, but our goal really kind of moving forward is just be more proactive about helping them get those engagements. Because once you have a book, like the sky is the limit in terms of your speaking opportunities, because it really is the thing that kind of puts you you know, side by side, someone who might be competing for the same business. And if you have the book and they don't or vice versa, like that's going to be the one that's going to be like that, the, the tipping point. That's like, you know, what, I'm going to go with the one that has the book because there's some inherent credibility that's assigned to being a published author. Absolutely. I want to just pull out something you said about uh, the groups where people are sharing their fees and things like that. I mean, you and I were talking a little bit uh, beforehand off camera just about wanting to do capitalism better, right? We talk a lot about like queering capitalism and queering the paradigm. Um, part of this is that within our community, we do tend to be very generous with one another, share opportunities. And I love this thought about sharing access to, you know, here's what my fees are, here's what my pricing mm -hmm. is, how, here's how I did this. How do you see that in, in our types of communities different from what mm -hmm. it's been like traditionally? Such a good question because I find like, so I have intentionally put myself into queer spaces the majority of my time. Like, that's really like where my happy place is. And before being a book publisher, I wrote five books around LGBTQ um, communications, marketing, things like that for people who are the business owners or employees. And so that's kind of been my, my space since 2006. So I, like my network and my people are predominantly queer. However, I still have to suck it up and attend events that are maybe local. I'm in the Hartford, Connecticut area. And like, it just, to me, it just doesn't feel the same. And it's not to say that I don't love the people that I, I go and, and network with. Cause I'm, you know, I'm a, our, my business is also B Corp certified. So it's really about sustainability and environmentally conscious practices. I'm also a women owned certified business. So then like, those are the networking environments I find myself in. But even within those, like even in just the women specific spaces, I see more often than not the, I don't want to say the cattiness because that, I feel like that, kind of puts it into like a stereotypical archetype, but there's definitely not a free flowing exchange of, hey, this is who I'm talking to. Do you have any details about so-and-so? Or, hey, this is what I'm going to try to put out there for my pricing. Like, what do you think about it? But I see those conversations in queer spaces all of the time. And what's really fascinating, and I don't remember the, the actual hashtag, but it was a couple months ago, right when all of the, like when Black Lives Matter really, really intensely blew up, there was a hashtag around equity in advances in publishing. So some Black woman started this huge trend where it was all of these mostly women of color who were coming out and saying, well, I got a $5,000 advance. And then a white woman would come in and be like, well, mine was 75000 And then like it turned into this whole most beautifully amazing thing. And I get chills thinking about it because it was so amazing to kind of just watch this one woman who was like, F this, like, I'm going to say, like, I'm going to really point out the disparities and how many allies kind of came into that conversation. So that was really cool. And I think, you know, I think as queer people, we're, we're already an underdog in most of the settings that we show up in, whether we perceive ourselves as such or not. And so I think by helping each other and being allies to other adjacent groups that we can be allies to, that's the way that we're all going to kind of collectively make a bigger impact and a bigger change. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And I love that, you know, that type of allyship takes some bravery and we don't, you know, yeah. we don't talk about that 
very much. We don't like, you know, because it sounds a little so, oh, allies being so brave, but you know, it's hard to put yourself out there and say, yeah, you know what? I got the $75,000 advance and I want to tell you that because this is fucked up and this isn't fair. And like, I want to help you do something about that. Yeah, which is so, it is brave because I have no idea what those publishing contracts or agreements are with each of those individual people. And for all we know, there's probably some kind of clause that tells people that they can't disclose that information. Because for so long, you know, especially within publishing, everything is so like, there's a gatekeeper at every turn. It's all cloak and dagger. Like you don't really know what's going on. So I'm confident that some of these contracts probably have a clause in it that states that you can't reveal what your advance was. But you know, there were people out there that were like, the hell with it, I'm going to say it anyway. And I don't know what, if anyone had repercussions from that, but, you know, it's still, you know, I feel like if I were in that situation, I'd be one that would be speaking up about it too, to be like, listen, I'm just going to throw my name in the ring just so you can see what my number was too, to at least compare to just advocate for yourself to get what you, what you rightfully deserve. And just because you're a woman or a woman of color or a queer woman does not mean that you are not as deserving, if not more of the cisgender straight white male. Absolutely. And it's interesting to talk about how these things permeate into entrepreneurial settings because a lot of us started businesses and left the corporate culture because we didn't feel like we were being treated fairly or had the same opportunities. Obviously, in a lot of corporate culture, it's not cool to talk about your salary with other people in the company, <laughs> things like that. Um, I try to, you know, when I'm running my company, I try to do that differently and make sure everybody knows what everybody makes and why and I'll, you know, be very, very transparent about that. But that's obviously been stuff that's been very hush hush for a long time. And we know when people start sharing that information uh, and this is why companies don't want them to, when people start sharing that information, it's like, Oh my God, this is really fucked up. Mm -hmm. Um, And everybody can kind of band together. It's interesting how we think we're escaping that when we come to start businesses, but these types of dynamics play out even when you're working for yourself, because you're still looking to get clients that are still paying you maybe something different than they would pay somebody else. Yeah. Which is such a, just a, it's a tragedy, but it's the way that the world works. And so if we can't have the, the courage to speak our truth, then we can't expect others to speak our truth for us. And so I think, but I also think that that's really hard. I feel like you and I are both very seasoned business owners at this point. Like I've been doing my own thing for well over a decade at this point, but I can see how it'd be really, really upsetting or confronting for someone who is at that phase, like right now where they're, they're thinking like, you know, I'm having this bad experience with my employer where I'm not able to be my full self. I'm not able to be out in the workplace. I want to kind of go out and stake my own ground and, and you know, plant the flag in the sand. of like, I'm going to do this thing. But there are so many unknowns and so many variables in there. And if you're already kind of coming from a less confident place as a queer person, I think that's also what can be really, really challenging too. Because look around in any direction and there's plenty of things that can tell you that you're lesser than somebody else. But, you know, it just takes, I think, a lot of maybe resilience might be part of the word of just just kind of like always coming back and like getting knocked down and coming back and coming back over and over again until you really actually have that confidence within you. And then once you're at that point, you have to be the beacon to bring the other people along to be like, listen, I did it. So like, come on, like, let's go. Like, what are you waiting for? Like, chop, chop. So it's, um, I think it's a, a hard, it's a big responsibility, I think, as well. Absolutely. And you know, that's a lot of what I, what I do in my work and what I deal with in my work, because we're starting, we work with a lot of startup queer entrepreneurs. And one of the things that I hear over and over and over is people telling me uh, what I call like black and white thinking, like I could never charge this much or people will not pay. And I always kind of tell my clients, anytime you have a black and white statement, like it's wrong. The truth is always gray. It's always nuanced. It's always (laughs) something like some people will pay, or it's more likely that this will happen or, you know, but, but we get these messages drilled into us, especially queer people you know, you're not worth that. No one will pay that. Nobody wants that. Um, and they come to me with this. I'd really love to do this, but I know that nobody will pay for this. And it's Mm -hmm. like, and I've got five other clients doing the same thing, making 10 times what they're even talking about. Sometimes we need somebody to show us what's possible before we can even see, you know, what's possible totally, let alone what's possible for us, because there's so many people that are coming to me and they're, it's like their horizons are so small. Mm-hmm. because yeah. they've just been told their whole life, you know, stay in this box, stay small, stay small. Um, that's not for you. That's for somebody else. And mm-hmm. when I'm coming along and saying, no, that's for you too. This is like a mind blowing experience, just mind blowing conversation. What you think I can do that. And I'm like, yeah, not only can you do that. I know a whole bunch of other people that have already done that. So come on, let's go. <laughs> and sometimes just yeah. seeing that possibility is what it takes to kickstart somebody on that journey toward actually achieving yeah. that thing. And I think that's why shows like this are so important because then it shows and illustrates to people who are in that, that ideation phase of, 
yeah, look, like there are successful people who have paved this path for you. Like you just have to like walk in the right direction and find the right, you know, beacons of hope as you're kind of going along that are going to pull, pull you forward. Because I feel like for me, like I'm always, and I've been in this, I feel like this phase forever of just like mentoring people. Like I'm always whether it's a formal mentorship that I'm involved in, or if it's just informally, like somebody saying like, Hey, can you give me a few minutes? Like I will always say yes to those things because if I can have some even microscopic impact on that one queer person who was just, just needed one person to say it to, to be the thing that actually confirms it for them. Like, why wouldn't we want to want to be kind of part of that? And I think, you know, it gets harder, obviously, as you get your business gets bigger and bigger and the team gets bigger and bigger. So it does get more challenging. But as long as that's kind of one of those core principles that you, and, and that's if it feels right to you too. I'm not saying you have to, like if you're a successful queer business owner that you have to have this. But I find that most successful queer business owners will always make time for someone who is kind of just starting out to be like, let me point you in the right direction at the very least. Like that's the least I can do because then it helps all of us when they do become successful because it gives them, it gives us more access to opportunities as well as them. And you can't go wrong with that. That's absolutely right. And this is why I'm really dedicated to figuring out this path toward, toward some type of benevolent capitalism here. And I know that makes me kind of public enemy number one for a lot of people when I say that, but I do think that it's a system in which uh, there's a lot more opportunity for eventual equity um, whereas we know that, you know, t socialist type of systems, et cetera, they all sound good in theory. And then what happens in real, in, in reality, especially for queer people or anyone that's non-conforming in any way is really, really, really not good. So for me to try to help produce a world in which we can actually be ourselves, we can express as ourselves. It's not about everyone having to be the same and conform to the same system, which is often very, very dangerous for folks like us, mm -hmm. right? How can we expand horizons about what's possible and help each other do that, bring each other along and show each other the possibility of that? And you're right, this show is about showcasing that and saying, look, I'm successful, you're successful, there's successful people doing this. We're also here to talk to you. We're also here to help you. Like we're not uh, people behind a screen. I know mm -hmm. you or I, either one of us, anyone watching this could, could uh, email us, call us up mm -hmm. or whatever, and then we would get on the phone with them and chat with them. Absolutely. Yeah. And that offer stands like currently, I know we're saying it like hypothetically, but yes, if someone like, I'm happy to talk to anybody. So me too. Yeah, just call, to, us, you know, call to, us up. We're here to yeah. help. We're You're here to help. And we're here to show you what's possible because this is possible. We've done it. And I don't know um, what your background was or what you, where you came from. I didn't, I didn't come from anything and I never thought that I could have you know, a million dollar business until I saw people, friends of mine doing it and thought, well, if they can do it, I can do it. I've always had that arrogance, right? Same. I got into an Ivy League grad <laughs> school because one of my campaign friends got into Harvard Law and I was like, if that guy can get into Harvard Law, like I can get into business school at Dartmouth and that's how I did it. And then I saw my friends, you know, starting businesses and getting real, and it was like all of a sudden, if that person can do it, if she can do it, if he can do it, if they can do it, so can I, and here I am. And now I'm kind of the person that wants to turn around and say, hey, if I can do it, mm -hmm. I'm just a regular person. If I can yeah. do this you can do this. Yeah. Let's do this. Right. That's absolutely 100%. I could say the exact same. I do not come from money. I do not come from any wealthy background whatsoever. Everything to, had been bootstrapped and like trial and error and, you know, finding that like, everybody's like, Oh, it's this, you know, path. It's like one to two, one plus one equals two. And it's like, my, my path was not even close to that. Like I started off, like my background is marketing. So my master's in marketing and communications, my undergrads are communications. And so like, that's what I thought I was going to go work for an advertising agency in Connecticut, which is how I ended up here to begin with, um, that, that um, Diageo, that represents alcohol brands. Like that was my, my vision, was advertising for alcohol brands. That did not happen. I ended up in an insurance company because that's what happens in Connecticut. And I ended up getting discriminated against. And it was like really overt discrimination. And I did everything I could to try to fix the company culture. And it was a complete loss. And I was there for about five and a half years. And finally, I was like, I'm out. Like, I can't do this anymore. Like, I can't be hiding who I am, being called a dyke in the, in the lunchroom, like just really like shitty things. And so then I was like, you know what, I'm just going to use this experience and help other people in their workplaces or in their businesses not do what this horrible company has done to me. And so that is not a linear path in any way, shape or form. But I think that that's kind of the best part about being a queer person, because there's so many to me, like superpowers and advantages that we do have as queer people. And I think especially as a white queer person. And I know this sounds like awful, but I do think in a lot of ways we're able to navigate a very, very, very gray area. Absolutely. Where we're able to like not disclose who we are Absolutely. or what we do, or, you know, like somebody could be like, oh, she's just kind of tomboyish. Like no one knows unless you tell them. So I, I do find that that's a, a very uh, big privilege, but we have to use that 
to everyone else's benefit by infiltrating, kind of being that Trojan horse that gets in the room and then brings all of the other people with them. And so if we're thinking this is slightly derailing, but if we think about supplier diversity, right? So we as companies that make certain revenue sizes, so certain revenue markers, right? There's a whole team of people below everything that you do, everything that I do. And there's a whole huge amount of vendors that are also supporting the infrastructure and the ability for us to do what we do. And so that is our opportunity as the person at the top to say, no, I'm not going to source this from a cisgender straight white male company. I'm going to make sure that I am giving this opportunity to somebody that is a diverse supplier and whatever that diversity might look like. And so we have like a very rigorous supplier diversity program. We're very intentional about what vendors we work with, what people are on the team, just to make sure that you're giving access to those opportunities, which kind of goes back to a little bit earlier of what we were saying is that, you know, if we're able to be like front and center and turn around and be like, yeah, I want to take you with me. That's the benefit of people who maybe have smaller businesses who are able to say like, maybe I can just do some web work for that more successful business. And then that makes their business better. And then you're working with another queer person. So like it all intertwines together in a very, very large macro type of way but you have to be really intentional about it. And I think the more intentional we can be and the more educated we all are about these things, the more it's the rising tide, tide floats all boats. Absolutely. And I think that's what we're all about. And that's kind of the, the whole underlying principle of Queer Hustle too. It's really mm -hmm. about creating our own little micro economy and helping yeah. each other out and bringing everything along. And we know, we know even in the Queer Hustle group, like kind of who does what and who the person, the go-to <laughs> person is to call in. And I don't feel bad about that. It's, it, you know, it's been happening for, decades, centuries, whatever, in old boys clubs. And so if I can uh, help create something or lend myself to something that creates an alternative to an old boys club and is a different type of club and we can all help each other, like I'm fucking all for it. Seriously, that's what makes it so amazing. And that's why I, there's so much beauty and magic in working with authors in general. And I love, I just love it so much because we get to be so intimately involved with what someone is doing and what their topic is because we're working on like their, you know, their, their masterpiece of all of their thought leadership. But what's also really cool is that we develop such a deep level of trust with the authors that we work with, which is not the case for many other publishers, but like, I've been very intentional about this. And so they'll say like, Hey, I need to redo my website. Who do you recommend? And so I have a list of recommended web developers and every last one of them is certified, a certified diverse business in some way, shape or form. So whether it's a gay owned business, a minority owned business, woman owned, doesn't matter. Like there's everyone on that list holds one, if not two certifications. And so that's again, another opportunity is that maybe they're not getting my dollar, but now they're getting the dollar from my author. And so it's the same thing. Like we have marketing needs every damn day of the week, it seems like. So there's always needs for something. And if you can be that that hub to be that alternative to the, to the old boys club, like you say, like that's really, it might be micro, it might be really, really micro, but it doesn't matter because if we're all doing it really, really micro, it creates like this big intricate web where everybody wins. And now we have a macro effect. And now we have created something that helps everybody out. And most of the people that I work with that are queer business owners are doing things to help society. Some, some are helping queer community directly. Some are doing things that are, you know, helping society at large, but almost everybody I work with is doing something that makes life better for people. And that's why I'm proud to help them increase their impact and scale those businesses. It's not about helping someone line their wrist with Rolexes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about helping people provide good jobs. A lot of the people that I know, and, and, and it sounds like you are in this boat too, quit the, the corporate job in order to create something better. Not, you know, first for our own self-preservation, like, fuck that. I'm going to create a job that I like where I can be myself. But then yeah. let me turn around and be a different kind of boss, yeah. right? I've had business mentors tell me, oh, you know, you can save so much money by just putting everybody on contract and hiring everybody overseas. And, and I'm like, no, you know, I'm hiring people here. We're paying market wages. We're paying, benef you know, full benefits. Mm -hmm. We're taking care of people. Yeah. And that's part of why I even wanted to do this in the first place, not just to like get it rich as possible, as fast as possible, but to turn around and be a good employer and create good jobs for people who don't have those opportunities in a lot of corporate America. Yeah. And I think there needs to be more good employers out there. And I think there are a lot of good employers out there, but like there's always room for more because there's always going to be another queer person who is in the closet at a job and they're, they're suffering in their mental health or maybe just their creativity or whatever it happens to be. So there's always going to be room for more people to be really solid employers and really solid stellar bosses. So, you know, like to me, the more the merrier, and even just kind of looking at, you know, how 
like I have a couple of friends who like, you know, maybe their husbands have the same job that they've had for like 35 years. And I'm like, I don't know how that is even possible because my brain could not possibly allow me to be in the same place for that long. But that's the beauty about being a business owner. And that's also, I think the benefit of me do, working with books is that while yes, the process is the same, the authors are different and the topics are different. And so it like feeds my ADD in like a really healthy, productive way versus like having these like, oh, I've been at the same job for 15 years, 20 years, whatever the number is. But like, I don't think that that's how young people think anymore. Like they're not looking for like that one job that's going to be like the ticket for the rest of their life. So like we have to be mindful from an employer standpoint, like what is going to be the thing that actually attracts that really awesome person to our organization? It really comes down to our values. And if we're very like wide open, like I could not be any more out if I tried. Like I am, and that also partly comes from my previous consulting work of calling myself the professional lesbian. So that will follow me forever. But what's great is that if somebody, you know, goes to, they Google my name, that's, that's coming up all over the place. And so that is a great weeding out mechanism because they're never even gonna get on the phone with me to begin with. And like, that is a beautiful thing because then you're not wasting your time with people that are just not fully aligned. So I think that's like just one of those other benefits of really being out, being very clear that like you are open for business for anyone who's inclusive, who, you know, wants to have that more inclusive experience, um, whether it's an employee or a client. I love that. I mean, I just think we're saying the same thing. It's like, look, start your business, write your book, get on the stage, be a, be a boss, be an awesome boss mm -hmm. and do it because the more you do it, the more you give other people permission to do it. Not only are you creating those opportunities, uh, changing your own life, you're changing other people's lives and you're giving somebody something to aspire to and look to. And we are, there's a whole bunch of us, me and you included, and a whole bunch of other people that are here to completely help you do that. Uh, if that's what you want to do, if you're ready to get out front and ready to shine. And we want you to do that. I want more shining stars from the queer community, more beacons of light, of diversity of all sorts. Uh, and people that, and, and you don't have to work with people that you don't want to. And that's the thing. Like what you just said is so important. We, we call it attract and repel when we teach marketing, right? You want to attract who you want. You want to repel the people that you don't. And repelling is just as important as attracting in your marketing, right? We don't yeah. want to waste time on the phone with somebody that we wouldn't want as a client. And a lot of people are, especially queer people that I talk to, afraid to go into business for themselves because, oh, I would have to uh, work with people I don't want. I need the money. You know, they've got this scarcity mindset. And it's like, no, 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 no. You don't have to work with anybody you don't want to. In fact, you have much more control over that as an entrepreneur than you do when you work for somebody else. So you can come, you can be you, you can work with the people you want, do the work you want, you know, it's yeah. awesome. And, and I think that a lot of times what people don't realize too, is that if they do take on that client that they're like, not really a hundred percent on them, it's going to end up costing them way more money in the long run. But like, I think especially the, the newer, the newer, uh, you know, startup business or very early on in their, their entrepreneurship, like probably doesn't fully understand like how important that is. So yeah, I think repelling people is a, a beautiful thing, which is why, you know, previously I'm now divorced, but previously anytime I'd be talking to somebody and it wasn't a hundred percent like where they might've stood, I would intentionally drop wife into the conversation just to make it clear that like, if this is a problem for you, let's end the call now. And like now, like if I can find a way, I'll say ex-wife just to, you know, like, and, and I don't do it like obnoxiously, but there are times where you're just trying to like, sniff out like, okay, is this person like legit or not? And I will always like, you know, research or somebody on my team will kind of research and give me like the rundown. Cause I'm not going to even like podcasts and things like that. Like I'm not going to go on someone's show if they are overtly hateful toward any group of people. Of and so there's like an added level of due diligence that has to happen. Cause I think for a lot of people, they'll go speak and talk on any show ever anywhere. And it's like, yes, that, that might be okay. But like, did they just have somebody that was like, anti-LGBTQ as the guest the week before, because yeah. that's probably not a good fit. So like, these are the things that as queer people, we kind of have to always be thinking about that the average person might not actually have to be thinking about, but it doesn't have to be a burden. It just has to be like a way of being. And if you can kind of like get that in your, your DNA and your way of being from the start, then it just kind of comes natural. And it's not, it's not an added headache or anything like that. You've been doing this for a long time, 10 years. Congrats on that, by the okay. way. That is not easy to do. And certainly uh, when I hear that, just like when I hear somebody that's been married for 30 years or something, I'm like, wow, you've really stepped through a lot of shit to get where you are. And that's mm -hmm. great. Uh, a lot of people watching this are people who are just starting businesses or thinking about starting businesses. Um, what would you tell them? I feel like if I try to go back to my 2009 me, 
where I was like, I need to get out of this job or I like nothing, no, no good is coming if I stay in this horrible work environment. I really took a crazy leap of faith. And my now ex-wife and I were together for like six months at the time. And I was like, listen, I'm quitting my job. And she's like, do you have a plan? I was like, nope. Um, like I had one thing that I, I just like in my gut, like instinctually knew that it would work out. It might not be an easy road. Like I, I gave up benefits. Like it was a whole, and like I had a pretty decent salary. And I was just like, I need to trust my gut. And I think that that would be the thing that I would tell everybody is that so often we fight with our gut. Like our gut knows, like we instinctively know what we need to do next, but we fight it with our logic and we fight it with being pragmatic and logical. And it's like, that's not actually helping us. Like just go with like your gut instinct. And I knew that I had to get out of that job. There was no doubt in my mind. And I had a contract that was like, kind of, sort of, I had like a 75%. I was like, I think this is going to work out. And I was like, you know what, if I don't jump, like, I'm just going to be stuck where I am. So I think that, you know, there is a little bit of, you know, and I'm a very pragmatic person. So there is a little bit of like, okay, let's just, don't just, I'm not saying like, just go quit your job tomorrow. Like be a little bit more rational about it and like, make sure that you have some kind of savings saved up. And it doesn't have to be like, you know, everyone says like, oh, you need to have six or nine months in savings. Like, I'm not saying that level of like preparedness, but like just jump when that opportunity appears, because if you don't jump, like you will end up regretting it and you'll still just be stagnant where you are. And I know that that's not a super helpful tip probably because it, it's like one of those scary ones that makes it really challenging. It's not like a, Hey, go take this course. It's just like really kind of trust your intuition because I think the times that I haven't trust my intuition, like it has boomeranged back and hit me hard when I did not trust what my gut was telling me. And it had it happen twice in 2020 where I was like, eh, it was two separate, um, separate client situations where I'm like, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do it anyway. I'm just gonna kind of ignore what my body is telling me and uh, regret times a hundred on both, both accounts. So, you know, and that's after, like I started my business in 2009. So like that's after almost 12 years. Um, and I, I still try to like doubt it occasionally, but at least it was only twice versus a daily occurrence. That's right. We just get better. We don't get perfect. We get yeah. better every day, trusting your gut, take those leaps. You're almost always right. And when you're not right, you learn something from it. Uh, sure. Yep. Jen T. Grace, Publisher Purpose Press. Thanks so much for being with us on Queer Hustle today. It's been awesome having you. Yeah, thank you so much. This was great. Bye, everybody. We'll see you next time.